Well, hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're at in the world today. Happy to have you here for another Altero sponsored webinar on how to become a Power CLI superhero. Five use cases to get started. My name is Andy Sirwich, and uh, as always, I've you know got someone here to kind of help co-present and bring their knowledge. I've got uh, Xavier Avrilier. <laughs> I think I got that correct, right? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, perfect. Well, Xavier, thanks for for coming on today and kind of sharing your knowledge here. I know automation is always an interesting topic, and you know those guys that do it well. You know, we we always love to to have you on the show. So appreciate you uh, you being here today. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah. So this is a very demo centric webinar, and um, I think I've made all the requisite sacrifices to the demo gods. So hopefully, all of our demos will go. We'll go fine today. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. <laughs> so, um, but that's the beauty of a live webinar too. It's like, what's going to happen, right? <laughs> so, well, we got a lot of content to get through, including uh, those demos. So let's dive right into the agenda today. So uh, we're going to start with some introductions of myself, Xavier, uh, Altera Software, uh, the sponsor of today's webinar. And then we're really going to dive into the topic we're discussing today. And that's um, getting started with Power CLI, and then we're going to start going through five different use cases and demos. So, you know, sections three through seven all have a live demo associated with them. So, um, you know, first thing we're going to do is show you how do you install Power CLI on non Windows operating systems. Um, and then Xavier is going to go through testing Power CLI code with vCenter and Docker. We're going to talk about HTML reporting with Power CLI. Uh, how does Power CLI integrate and work with third-party REST APIs? And then finally, um, to kind of you know bring a lot of stuff together and show something a little bit more complex, uh, Xavier is going to talk about building Power CLI tools near the end. And then finally, we'll uh, wrap up with some Q&A. One thing to note about the Q&A, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, be sure to use the uh, GoToWebinar form to kind of drop in your questions as we go through the session today. If we can kind of organically stop and address that question you know, as we step through the content, we certainly will. Otherwise, we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Now, one thing we always do with these webinars is <clears throat> if we don't get to one of your questions um, because of time constraints, we always do a, some sort of follow-up blog post where we post the uh, recording, um, a link to the slide deck. You'll, you'll get all of those things along with a full list of the questions and their associated answers, even the ones that we don't cover in the webinar today. We'll make sure you get a uh, get an answer to. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's start with some introductions. And being as I'm kind of the one talking already, I'll uh, I'll go ahead and do mine really quick before passing things over to Z Xavier. Uh, my name is Andy Sirwich. Again, um, I am a technical evangelist for Altero Software. Um, I am a Microsoft MVP and a VMware V expert as well. Um, my MVP competency is in the cloud and data center management competency. So it's uh, I've always been in the infrastructure, you know, virtualization, storage, networking space, um, pretty much my entire career. Um, you know, which is dating myself a little bit now, but it's it's been it's been 20 years um, <laughs> this year. So um, the only difference between then and now is I have a few more gray hairs and a little bit more weight around my midsection. So. Um, but yeah, that's me. If you're a Twitter user, you can go ahead and reach me at, at a Sirwich. My apologies, you'll have to spell the last name. Um, but if you have any questions after the webinar, you want to reach out to me, you can do so there. And then I'll pass things over to Xavier to do his introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Xavier Verlier. Uh, I am based in France, hence the... Um, hence the weird name, let's say. Um, so I am a freelance consultant. I work in uh, IT in general, infrastructure, mainly virtualization on VMware technologies. Uh, I'm also the expert since uh, 2016, I think. Uh, it's been five or six times now. Uh, it's through my it's through my blog, vixar.fr, if you want to check it out at some point. And uh, yeah, so my... Uh, my motto, as I used to say, is um, help is an alias of get help in PowerShell. So I think it's a nice, uh, a, a nice way to interact with the community. When you write something, when you get something from the community, it's nice to give back uh, when you when you can help. Sounds good. Thanks, Xavier. And fun uh, piece of trivia: my personal favorite PowerShell command is get help <laughs> because yeah. 
Just my memory's one. not great. I use get help all the time. So I, I like yeah. your motto. It's a, it's a friend. Yep. Yep. All right. So a quick word about today's sponsor, uh, Altera Software. So uh, Altera Software was founded in 2009 with offices in the United States, UK, Germany, North Macedonia, and Malta. Um, you know, we've got 50,000 plus customers, 10,000 plus partners worldwide, 2,000 plus MSPs. We've seen some really strong growth over the oh, the last several years. Um, the, one other key thing, you know, if you're a, a frequent Altera webinar uh, attendee, one thing that's different on the slide that you'll notice is that uh, we are now part of the Hornet Security Group. So you may see some of the Hornet, uh, Hornet Security logos throughout, and um, we are part of that group and uh, looking forward to what that brings in the uh, the coming months, days, and years. So with that, I want to lead with a little bit of a poll. I want to just kind of see you, the audience, how are you using Power CLI today? Just to kind of get a baseline of where everyone's at. So I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll here. Um, how do you currently make use of Power CLI? So I'm going to go ahead and launch that. And you'll see that pop, on, pop up on your screen here shortly with a couple of options. You know, I don't currently use it for interactive administration, for infrequent deployment automation, deep task automation and integration, or for infrastructure and unattended task reporting. So a couple of different options there. Uh, feel free to check the ones that uh, that you use. And you know, if I had to guess, Xavier, um, I would guess that most people probably use it for interactive administration. Um, I think that's probably the most common use case I've seen. There's something in the UI that they can't really do, so they, yeah. they turn to the, the shell, right? Is that kind of what you've seen in your, your experience? Yeah, I think I agree because uh, there's lots of things you can do interactively. Uh, there's also a bunch of things you can do in uh, you can do in Power in uh, Power CLI that you can't do in the vSphere um, in the vSphere UI. Yep. Uh, there's stuff that you can do in, in in Power CLI really easily and quickly in like a one liner in one minute that you would have to go through uh, pages and pages of you know scrolling down the vSphere UI to get to the bottom of what you're after like you know, learns and stuff like that. So I think interactive administration is probably one of the most used uh, kind of thing for Power CLI, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Yep, well, I've got the results here and it's it's close to what we predicted. I'm gonna go ahead and share mm -hmm. the results here. And it's really close to what we, we predicted. We've actually got a tie between, I don't currently use it, and for interactive administration. And we do have a couple of folks that are using it for you know, more complex automation tasks. So that's always good to see. Um, this kind of ends up where I figured we would with most people using it for interactive administration, kind of more on the beginner end of the, beginner to intermediate end of the spectrum, I would say. So good to see. Um, and uh, yeah, we use these polls for coming up with content ideas for future webinars, videos, blog posts, that type of thing, that type of thing. So definitely appreciate you all uh, participating in that. So with that, let's dive into the content. And Xavi, I think uh, you're up first with some resources for getting started with Power CLI. Why don't you uh, take it away, my friend? Yeah, no problem. So yeah, I wanted to touch base on uh, a few technical bits. Uh, so there's there's two aspects to scripting uh, in general that I want to touch base on is the technical bits and the non-technical bits. So in this part, uh, there's the first and you know obvious one: uh, get the latest version of PowerShell Power CLI. So it may sound obvious, but according to which version of Windows you're running, be it Windows 10 edition, build whatever, or same thing for Windows Server you won't get the same PowerShell version. So try and get the latest one and same thing for Power CLI. Uh, so back in back in the days before, I think it was 6.5 or 1, uh, it was like 2016, 17. Uh, it used to be like a, a, an installer, like a, um, a software that you would install on your, on your computer. And now these are actually Power CLI modules provided by VMware on the Windows NuGet. So you just have to install module in, in your PowerShell session as an, as an administrator, and then you get, just get the modules. So you'll find some stuff on that uh, on the Altaro website in the blogs. That's all you need to know. It's also covered in the ebook that we released, uh, the second version uh, recently. Um, then there's a, like, 
three common leads that I want to I want to mention, like honorable mentions: uh, get comment, get help, and get member. So get help, we kind of already talked about it in the in the introduction. So get comment will help you find your way around. Uh, so when you don't really know what comment you want to use, uh, you know you you have something to do with snapshots. You'll do just uh, get comment star snapshot star, and you'll get all the comments that include snapshots in the name. So that's a great uh, a great starter point. And then you can use get help on that comment list to get information on it. So you have details on what it does, uh, what parameters it takes, uh, examples on how to use it. That's that's a really great way to to learn because you see how it's meant to be used. Because sometimes I might be using a command let wrong. And when I look at the examples, I'm like, well, yeah, actually, it's a better way to, 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 to do it this way. And uh, then there's get member, which will give you information on the object that you got with your command let. So you'll get what class, what type of object it is, uh, what properties you get, what methods you can use, uh, what properties on your methods. So, you know, with these three command lets, you can already do a lot of things and have a lot of information on, on PowerShell and PowerCLI. So that's that's really PowerShell, it's not PowerCLI related, you know, uh, it applies to, to PowerShell in general. And then, you know, the, the, the title of this uh, webinar is uh, how to become a PowerCLI superhero. So I thought it ties pretty well with uh, Uncle Ben's uh, motto, uh, well, not a motto, but uh, Uncle Ben's advice to Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. So when you do stuff, when you're starting out with PowerShell, I always suggest you stick with get common lets because you don't want to uh, you don't want to mess a pattern matching. Go stop VM uh, star fin star for if you want to stop all the finance VMs. But uh, you didn't realize that there's a whole bunch of VMs with fin in the name, and then you stop the whole bunch of the production. So when you start, stick to get common lets and always double check your pattern matching. Uh, because you can do quite a lot of damage if you don't do it right. And then you get the usual advice like avoid like big scripts with everything in it. Uh, don't use hard coded, but hard coded values in the code, sorry, uh, because you want to improve, like make it more maintainable, uh, easier to maintain. Uh, some error handling, error handling, indentations, all these things. And uh, don't use a script you find randomly on, on the internet blindly. Always double check what it does. Try to understand it. Even if it's a script you find on my blog, don't use it blindly. Go through it. Try to understand what it does. Uh, just so you don't you, you get into good habits. Uh, and it's it's a nice way as well to learn uh, yourself. So you can do your you can write your own scripts later on. So that's that's the few technical things I wanted to to mention. And in the next slide, we will uh, talk about non-technical bits. What a surprise. Uh, so it's 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 more like how to approach scripting uh, in your organization. So some managers, some companies, departments, uh, they might see scripting as a waste of time, <clears throat> especially when you're starting. Uh, because you spend a lot of time, you know, searching, trying, test, testing, failing, trying again, failing again, and that's it's it's part of the process. You have to go through that if you want to have a resilient and solid script. So if your managers are kind of, you know, not really open to this idea, it's kind of your job to open their mind and uh, and uh, change their way of thinking about scripting and show them that there will be a return on investment, like. If you spend a week uh, automating something that you spend two days a week uh, over the course of a year, every week, then you will save tons of time. However, don't spend time automating things that are not worth it. Like if there's something you do once a year uh, for a day, don't spend three weeks automating it because then there's not really a point doing it. You're just gonna waste time. Apart from the fact that you will probably learn something in the process, it's not. It's not really something you 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 can you can uh, you can show your boss a return on, on investment. And uh, for the challenge of past self, I think of it as you know these uh, racing games, uh, these racing car games uh, we used to play on PlayStation, GameCube, 
uh, you used to, you know, you, you had your, your past self, your ghost with your high score, and you would try to beat it. So I think of it as your old scripts. If you have a script that's like six months, one year, two years old, uh, go back to it, try to improve it, optimize it, and uh, you might you might learn some stuff in the process. You might find that uh, you you since you write since you wrote it, you improved your writing, so you can do it differently. You can shorten it. Uh, you can add parameters and stuff like that. So it's always good to go back on your on your own scripts and challenge your past self. That's great advice. I, there's so many times I look at my old scripts and I'm like, why did I do it that way? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You know, it's yeah, it's that's just fantastic there. advice. So yeah, we've um, we republished uh, an ebook on Power CLI back in 2019, summer of 2019, something like that, uh, I think. And uh, earlier this year, we published a second edition, so we updated it, and uh, we added a few chapters with uh, uh, additional use cases and. Uh, the, the, the part of, about the, um, the container-based uh, vCenter simulator. So you might want to check it out. You, you'll find all these things, uh, how to get started with PowerCLI if you're a beginner. It's a, it, it's a good starting point as well. It tells you how to install it, what to check, uh, how to update it, and all these things. So you know you have to, to learn how to work before you run. So yeah, check it out, and uh, you, might, uh, you might be interested in it. Yeah, definitely. And one thing I will add to that, you know, what we're we're covering in the webinar today just kind of scratches the surface of what you can do with Power CLI. And what Xavier has done in the ebook has presented, um, boy, what is there, 15, 20 different use cases in there now, Xavier, on uh, different things you can do with Power CLI? Yeah, quite a few. Yeah, quite a lot. So definitely, it, it's very use case driven. So, you know, try to focus tasks that you as system administrators would need to do on a daily basis or weekly basis um, and just try to help you do your job better and try to automate more, right? So definitely, definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, you can go ahead and pick that up in the handout section of uh, the GoToWebinar uh, control panel there. I believe it's on the right side of your screen if I remember correctly. So anyway, um, anything else you wanna add on the ebook, Xavier, before we move on to the first demo? Uh, no, I think we're good. Sounds good. Well, I drew the uh, lucky straw on the first demo today. So again, I'm gonna cross my fingers and hope everything goes well. So the first thing we're gonna do is, you know, how do you actually install Power CLI? And in this case, um, we're gonna turn it on its head a little bit and actually install it on a non-Windows operating system. Um, so, because, you know, I'm sure everybody's seen the, the images flying around the internet. Microsoft, you know, loves Linux now, right? And I think a large part of that stems from the fact that, uh, 50% uh, or more of the workloads in Azure are actually Linux based. So I'm sure that drives a lot of it. So you've seen a lot of enhancements and, and um, you know, in, uh, innovations in the Linux space from Microsoft. And uh, that allows us to one, install PowerShell on Linux, which then allows us to pull in PowerCLI. And that's what we're gonna do for the first demo. So, um, well, I, uh, I intended this all to be one animation. Um, <laughs> there we go. All right. So, you know, PowerShell is installable on a number of operating systems now. Uh, I mentioned Linux. Uh, obviously, it's installable on Windows, um, and you can install it on Mac OS as well. Basically, anywhere PowerShell lives, you can pull in the PowerCLI module. And, you know, why would you do this? Why would you want to install PowerCLI on, you know, different operating systems or multiple locations? Well, I mean, Having it on any platform helps with adoption and usability. So maybe you're maybe you prefer Linux as your desktop, right? Maybe you prefer Mac OS. You know, being able to have Power CLI at your fingertips without having to log into a Windows machine somewhere is immensely useful. And not only that, let's say you know there's it's very common I've seen in a, a lot of organizations where they'll have some sort of automation server, right? That that server's entire job is to run automated tasks within the data center. So maybe you want Power CLI on that box and maybe it's running Linux, right? Um, so there's a lot of different reasons why you might want Power CLI on a non-Windows OS. Now, um, the requirements here, like I said, really the only requirement is any machine that can run PowerShell 5.1 or higher. 
Um, if you want the compatibility matrix info, you know, as you know, VMware, they, they uh, produce their compatibility matrix stuff um, for just about every product they have. Um, my apologies, it's a bit.ly link. The actual link was like really long and ugly. And uh, I try to shy away from using bit.ly links wherever possible, but uh, in this case, um, I ended up having to use one. So if you want the compatibility matrix info, it is right there. And with that, let's actually head over to the demo. So you should be able to see VS Code, right, Xavier? Just making sure it's coming uh, yeah, through, no okay. Problem. You can see it. All right, good deal. So in this particular demo, I'm using VS Code to basically run us through our demo. I've uh, created a script. It's not really a script. It's just a collection of uh, commands. And I'm going to be actually remoting into this Linux box that I am going to install PowerCLI on. So let's go ahead and SSH into that box first. And let's hope I don't fat finger the password. Yay, I didn't. Okay. And then just so you know, there's no smoke or mirrors. You see, hey, it's uh, Debian Linux. So this is actually uh, Debian version 10. Um, just so you know, there's no smoke or mirrors here. Here's a, uh, the kernel version is 14 or 14, <laughs> 4.19. And if we take a look at the sources list, this is the repository that I'm pulling the Debian packages from. You can see that, again, it's the latest version of Debian stable, uh, 10.9, codename Buster. And I'm using the University of Chicago uh, repositories. Now, um, you know, a lot of Linux distributions use sudo for escalating administrative privileges. Um, Debian does not, so I actually have to escalate to root using the su command. And again, hope I don't fat finger my password. <laughs> I did. I did fat finger it. There we go. All right. The joys of a live demo. Now, in order to install PowerCLI, um, Microsoft they provide the Power the PowerShell packages via a, another open source package management program called Snap. Now, most modern Linux distributions they will come with Snap pre-installed, but um, this version of Debian did not. So I've already installed it. So if you can see uh, the output of this app get install command, you can see that, hey, you know, SnapD is already the newest version. Um, if you're on a distro that doesn't come pre-installed with Snap, um, you just run these two commands here to go ahead and get that running. Now, for the sake of time, I've already gone through and installed that. Now let's actually go ahead and grab the PowerShell package. And I can do that using the Snap install PowerShell and you have to pass this classic um, this classic switch to the command, um, which is just basically um, the classic method of packaging the application using the Snap platform. Um, so if I go ahead and execute that, it will actually reach out using Snap, grab PowerShell, and it will install it. So here, see here, it's downloading it, and there, it's all set up and installed. And in the Linux world, I can get to PowerShell by using either of these two commands in Bash. I can either use the PowerShell command or PWSH works as well. So if we go ahead and execute that, you'll see, hey, I've got a nice fancy PowerShell prompt now right here inside of a Debian Linux operating system. And we can use it just like we use PowerShell anywhere else. So um, I can run git command and it returns the usual list of all the available PowerShell commands. Or more interestingly, I can run git process, and you'll notice it looks vastly different than uh, than git process usually looks. Uh, in that, I'm actually seeing the running Linux operating system processes. Um, so you know, you don't. It's kind of useful in those situations where you don't want to go launch top in a uh, in a, a bash shell. Um, so you can actually use git process to see the running processes on a Linux box. Now, again, this is a PowerCLI webinar, right? So let's get to the part where we actually install PowerCLI. And to do that, we use install module in PowerShell to pull down the PowerCLI commandlets. So here we're going to do that with the scope of current user. Now, I've noticed when you're running an interactive shell in VS Code here, um, yeah, so let's explain that in a second here. First thing we have to do is have to say, yes, it's okay to install from the PowerShell gallery. I'm just going to say A for all. Now, you'll notice 
it gets really, the console gets really flickery here for some reason. Um, and I've noticed when using an interactive shell in, uh, in VS Code, it kind of does this. When you're actually running this inside of an actual uh, bash shell on your, you know, on your Linux box, instead of from a, a tool like VS Code, um, you won't get like this flickery type of look. But we'll see, there, it's installed and um, we should be good to go now. So if I use git command and look for all the commands that have a module name containing the word VMware, I'll see that, hey, here are all the Power CLI commandlets. So we've essentially installed Power CLI now, um, and I can use any of the Power CLI commandlets just like I, I would on a Windows box. So uh, for example, if I wanna use git help for the update tools commandlet, we can see it here. Okay, yep. Here we've got the uh, the quick word about the VMware Customer Experience Improvement Program and the help file. So we can see here that you know this is for upgrading VMware tools on a specified virtual machine. So PowerCLI is installed again on top of a uh, a Debian Linux distribution, um, but it's supported on all the major Linux distributions um, as well. So all right, let's hop back to the slide deck really quick. I got to go through all my animations again. All right. Now, just to kind of summarize demo one, you know, we installed PowerCLI in a non Windows operating system. You know, we kind of talked about the use case a little bit already. Um, and again, you'll install this on any machine you want to make use of PowerCLI on. And is it single use or at scale? And really, this particular example, you could do it both ways. Typically, you're going to install PowerCLI as a single use type of uh, situation, but I could see some scenarios where maybe you want to script the installation. Maybe you've got multiple automation machines across your infrastructure that you want to get Power CLI on. You could script the installation um, using a, a combination of uh, PowerShell. And if you've got you know different operating systems on your uh, on your automation machines, maybe you'll put in uh, some some Bash scripting along with that. So. With that, I'm going to hand things over to Xavier to talk about uh, PowerCLI code with vCenter and Docker. So let me go ahead and change presenter to you, Xavier. Yep, I'm going to try and I'm going to try and uh, do that cleanly. Right. You should have the reins now. I see your screen. Just trying to get well. Oh. Never mind. Um, yeah, okay, so in this demo, we are going to stay in the Linux world for a bit because we are using Docker uh, to simulate a vCenter server. So the idea behind that is uh, that you have a really simple vCenter instance, like an endpoint to which you can connect but it's really it's really simulating an environment. There's no ESXi running. There's no vCenter running. It's uh, it, it, it's really like a, a container, a fake environment. So you don't need any resources. Uh, you just need like a small Linux VM, uh, for example, running in workstation, virtual box, or you know whatever uh, type two hypervisor you want to use. So in my case, it's a VM running on my home lab, uh, but you could do it uh, just with, I don't know, one, one gig of RAM, uh, if, if that, and uh, just install Docker engine, deploy the container, and uh, connect to it. So the, the, the big benefit of that is that you can use PowerCLI, but there's no risk associated with it. You can start playing with the commonlets, you can connect to vCenter, you can start getting comfortable with it. Uh, we'll see that there's a few caveats uh, to this simulator uh, because it doesn't always, you know, behave the same way a real vCenter would. Um, but you know, it's it's a pretty good starting point. Um, so we'll see how to install Docker and uh, then how to deploy the container, connect to it, and uh, what you can do with it. So let's go ahead and uh, connect to this Linux server. So I'm going old school. That's Putty. I haven't seen Putty in a while. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Putty. <laughs> it's a great tool. Yeah, so that's uh, my uh, my 
let's call, let's not call it Docker host like my Linux VM. Uh, so it's running on my vCenter. It's called Webinar Demo. So as you can see, there's there's not much requirements. Uh, five gigs of storage used. I've got what two gigs of RAM and uh, one CPU. So it's really a tiny VM. So the good thing here is that it will help beginners uh, really practice with Power CLI without requiring like. 16 or 24 gigs of RAM to run vCenter, ESXi, and everything. So we're going to start with. I'm just going to elevate my 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 session. It's it'll be easier. Apologies for the keyboard. It's a, a mechanical keyboard, so it's 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 quite noisy. Um, hope it's okay uh, in the in the mic. All right. So I'm going to start with a to get update as usual. So I'm running an Ubuntu 20.1 LTS. Um, just, you know, we we, we had a, an article that's set to be published in a, in a bit on the blog, and it's also called in the ebook uh, with a Debian distro, but I thought why not, you know, demonstrate it with Ubuntu just to, just to change a little bit. So, all right, when you updated your environment, you need to install a bunch of dependencies. So I didn't come up with these dependencies. They are uh, documented on the Docker website. So they might be meant to change in the future, I don't know. Uh, if you're running this procedure in you know, one, two, three years down the line, maybe check out uh, the Docker website just to get updated, uh, updated information on the, on the, pro on the process. And then we need to add, well, it, it's not mandatory and mandatory uh, step, but you might want to add the GPG key just so you don't have to, spe you don't have to specify it um, when, you, when, you, when you install uh, Docker. We are going to add the depot, the Docker repository, just so we are able to pull uh, the, the binaries and install the and install software. Run another run of another round of apt get update. As you can see, like Docker has been processed, and now we can finally install Docker. So it's it's um, the same procedure for any Docker host. Uh, nothing nothing particular in this case. Uh, even though it's a you know our CLI webinar, we I I thought we might. Might be interesting to go to to go through these, uh, these steps just to show you that installing Docker is really easy. Getting started with it, uh, you, you don't have to be an expert in Linux, Docker, and stuff like that to start playing with containers. So terminal text size. Okay, I'm gonna try. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's been so long since I've used Putty. I'm not sure. Yeah, me neither. Um, be... Right. Um, we're going to go really old school. <laughs> um, the, uh, the Mark Rasinovich trick there is what I always call that. He always uses the, the Zoom tool. Yeah, but it mess it messes with my uh, with my dual screen. So, um, yeah, okay. So I'm I'm gonna try and and fix it in in the in the next stages. Uh, at the moment, I'm just gonna keep going like that. Um, so the comments, I'm I'm just gonna say the comments that I, that I run because the ones I just typed, uh, it was copy and paste, and you'll probably go through the going to go through a copy and paste process as well because it's you know really long comments like uh, adding uh, repositories and stuff like that that's not really nothing interesting about it so uh, you can check uh, that your docker is installed with a system ctl uh, so to check the, the, the status of the service so system ctl docker and when you get that green uh, green goodness that says that docker is running and is active it means you are good to go and you can deploy your container 
So to deploy the container, it's it's really easy actually. This uh, this simulator was already in this vCenter 5.1, I believe. Um, and it, it it was you know it was somewhere in the ISO and uh, you, you could already use it, but it was a bit you know a bit complicated. So someone uh, with um, the username uh, v what what was the username again? Nimis uh, Nimis on the Docker Hub uh, like put it into a container and so now you just have to run it and uh, you pull the you, you pull the, the, the data from the public repo and you are good to go so it's gonna have to download it uh, from the public repository so I'm, I hope it's gonna be uh, a bit quicker oh yeah that should be okay so um, right now we are downloading uh, the image the image of our container so it's it's you just have to do it once uh, then in the next steps when you want to destroy the container recreate it because you messed up the environment you destroyed all the vms or the host uh, it'll be much faster because you'll just have to rerun the container uh, oh someone is uh, helping me settings appearance fonts right settings uh... so i've gotten so used to doing all of my uh, all of my linux sshing directly from PowerShell. So it's it's been years. It's probably been a year or two since I've I've used Putty. Much appreciated, yeah, folks. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I actually don't use don't use Linux much. Uh, I, I use Putty to connect to my vCenter, the SXI host and stuff like that. So it does the job just fine for me. Uh, I'm nowhere near being a Linux administrator with all the you know Red Hat satellite tools and stuff like that. Um, so thank you very much, guys, for pointing out the the font tips. I I never thought about changing the fonts in uh, in Putty, but good stuff. So I hope you can you can see it better now. All right. So um, now we've got our container. So if I run a Docker container uh, container ls there's my container running as you can see it's, it gets like a, a randomly generated funny name trusting cover whatever that means um so i can also use docker ps which does the same thing when you're about your running containers um so if you if you stop your containers it it wouldn't appear in docker container ls you would have to use the dash a uh, parameter which will display like, like the, the containers that are switched off hidden so here's my container as you can see port 443 so if i check port 443 on uh, this ip it should reply so it's uh, 192.168.190 uh, on port 443 so i'm using like a homemade uh, power powershell um, function that checks TCP ports. So you can see it replies on port 443. And now I am going to connect to it. So connect VI server, same IP. Username is U and the password is P. Uh, that's that's how the, the, the container is done. So it takes it takes a wee while to, to connect to it, a little longer than a traditional vCenter. So in the second window, I'm going to connect to my actual vCenter. So I have a, a, another function for that. It's a bit quicker. Right. So on the right, I have a real vCenter running. And on the left, I have the, the container simulated. So if I open the default VI server uh, variable, you see that there's one it, it, it's 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 similar however if i highlight all you'll see that there's a there's already a few differences uh some fields are some fields are empty uh there's you know there's going to be a few differences so in this simulator you can start playing with get vm host as you can see there's Four hosts that are uh, provisioned, uh, not actually provisioned, but simulated. So these three are in a cluster. If you run a get cluster, uh, it's, it's 
is it okay again uh, with the size? Uh, not sure. Might uh, increase it a little bit just so. Yeah, it's, it's a little better. Yeah, okay. Let's do it this way. Uh, so, get cluster. Um, you get a bunch of VMs that are already provisioned. Uh, as you can see, there's four VMs powered on. Uh, you can you can you can do whatever you want, uh, but some things will have different behavior. So, as an example, I'm going to take the creation of a template. So, on my fake vCenter, I'm going to create templates from a VM. Uh, so, actually, let's do this way. So, already you can see that there's a string. The output is a string. In my other vCenter, I'm going to create a template based on uh, based on the VM we're running data from. Actually, uh, it'll take a little bit longer uh, because we have to clone the disk because there's actually a disk. Uh, but you'll see it's you'll see it's a bit different. So if I run a get template on my Docker based, I get the template and get member. I see that it's of type template. So it's it's type template, but you you don't get you don't get the same methods uh, that are available, the same properties. Um, it's a little bit it, it's it's a little bit different in how in, in how it works. So if you are using this simulator don't and you are using a script of yours you find that it doesn't work there's errors don't think that it's a problem with your script it might be it might just be that uh, these methods are not implemented so as you can see in my actual vcenter the output was an object so it was a template object whereas in my container based one it was just a string so this kind of stuff will might throw you off at some points uh, might cause scripts to fail uh, but uh, it's just uh, how it is but um, yeah the thing is the the point of this demo was install docker deploy a container running connect to it and uh, start playing with it you can destroy all the vms uh, destroy all the hosts uh, but then if you mess it up, you just have to destroy the container and recreate it. That's it. So uh, really easy, uh, really, you know, very flexible. Now let me get back to my uh, slide deck. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the, you know, uh, creating, uh, deleting template, deleting the container, recreating it. It's, you get the gist of it, I think. So yeah, it's 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 pretty flexible. It's got good to start, but uh, at some point, you you might be a little bit limited by this by it. So uh, when if you can if you can get an actual ESXi vCenter running, it's better. But you know, good uh, good starting points uh, to start working with uh, with PowerCI. In the next demo, we are going to talk about HTML reporting. So HTML reporting is pretty cool. Uh, you can do lots of stuff. The good thing about uh, re HTML reporting in Power CLI is that you get to um, to have it tailored to your environment, meaning um, you can just you, you can you can pinpoint uh, every every aspect of your environment that you want to to to, uh, to report on. So I have uh, I have a our cell ISE ready for you. So I'm going to uh, connect it to my vCenter, connect VI server. Uh, Oops, so again, I'm going to try and uh, yeah, be in. Uh... Yeah, options there. You're going for font size, I think, right? Yeah, it's down there in the middle. Right. So this bit is just like uh, you know running um, an inventory of all the virtual disks in the environment. So I'm creating an edge and getting all the information, and then I will be converting it into HTML. So I'm running this bit. 
uh, it populates a variable called table in which you get all the data and then you can convert it convert it to html and put it into a file so that's what i'm going to do and then i can uh, what did they call the file the disk i think it is html and then i get all my uh, inventory into an html uh, html file html format so you can store that on a web server on your company or even on a share and just open the html file it will work as well you can add some style, some CSS, if you want to. Uh, in this case, I'm just adding, uh, you know, borders and uh, the, the altar or logo. Uh, I'm gonna open the B list as well. So no, actually, just gonna refresh. As you can see now, we've got borders. We got a nice logo up there. Um, if if the if it doesn't look the way you want it to look, you can. You know, do your own, make your own CSS and make it look uh, nice and uh, uh, according to your your organization uh, graphic chart. Uh, you might also want to to know when the when the script runs. So I'm going to use the pre-content parameter to add the execution time. And now that when we update it, now we get the time. So you know, because you know, especially for a vSphere administrator getting a report that's six months a year old it's completely worthless you don't you, you have no use for it uh, then you can you can keep going with it you can keep uh, um, improving it so in this case i'm i'm recreating it with a color condition so let's let's run that so i just updated the table so what I'm doing is that I'm setting a color state, a, a color like you know, a variable somewhere in the script that I replace later on when I create the HTML file. And now when I update it, uh, did I update it? Uh, yeah, the the demo effect. Uh, so. I should get I should get a line that's oh it's I don't know why it's because I used um, I used this condition on RDM disk uh, so it was based on which disk or RDM but uh, I accidentally deleted the VM I think or the line is not there anymore so based on that you you would get a line that's uh, blue uh, where you have an RDM so you know that's the demo effect sorry guys <laughs> shouldn't happen but uh you can also send your uh, you can also send it via email so in this case here uh, i'm putting into a variable called body and uh, then you send it uh, via email to whatever address you want with an SNTP server so here it's my you know uh provider and uh, get some credentials send the emails and then you get the report so it's it's a great way to it's a great way to get some reporting on your environment it's easy it's fast and it's tailored to exactly your needs so you don't need to go through really complicated uh, solutions uh, you, you you wouldn't need vr apps or stuff like that for simple reporting bit um so it's a great way to start great way to learn and uh yeah it's it, it's it's pretty good to do some reporting with uh with a power sailor and, and power shirt. so i think we're running kind of short on time so i'm gonna wrap it up and uh give the mic to andy yeah i think it's back to me i'm gonna grab presenter here really quick and show screen two you should see demo four the slide for it. Yep. Yep. Perfect. So yeah, we've got it, uh, about 10 minutes left and two demos to get through. So I'm going to scoot through this pretty quickly. Um, so next thing I wanted to talk about was utilizing third-party REST APIs with Power CLI. And, and so in this particular demo, we're going to be using the Altero VM backup REST API. So I'm using us as an example. Um, and how does it help IT pros? So there's lots of third-party applications in our environments 
Um, and being able to bring in and interact with those third-party applications as part of your automation efforts is immensely helpful, right? So typically anything with a callable REST API, you can, uh, you can talk to using the invoke REST method commandlet in PowerShell. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. So let me go ahead and end the slideshow and hop over to a virtual machine I've got here. Um, this time I'm using PowerShell ISC. Um, and just to verify, you can see that uh, demo environment, right, right, Zev? Uh, yeah, yeah, all, all right, good. perfect. So um, I've got a machine that's running the Altero VM backup um, services, which includes the REST API. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to check the status of the REST API service, which it's running. And then we're going to switch to this particular directory and list all the various commandlets. So what we've done as part of the application is we've pre-packaged a bunch of uh, of this REST API stuff into some, I guess I would call them beginner commandlets. So these are some commandlets that you can use to do uh, basic things with the API, but they're by no means the end all be all. So um, first thing we're gonna do here is we have to retrieve a session token. So we need to authenticate to the uh, to the API in order to pull any information. Uh, first thing I wanted to note is that you can actually pass the help switch to any of the uh, the commandlets in this directory, and it'll tell you how the application, how the uh, sorry, how the commandlet should be used. So we can see here, start session password shown, John Doe, my pass, my domain. Now, obviously, you know, in production situations, you would not want to have your password in plain text. And I've got say a link to some resources to help you get around that issue, uh, and a slide later in the presentation. Uh, but for the uh, time purposes, I've just used a password of password 01 on this particular local host. So let's go ahead and grab a session token. All right, so we've grabbed a session token. You can see that it outputs all this stuff in JSON format. So what I have to do is I have to go ahead and grab the session token and capture it in a variable. Now, you could certainly script that. You could use a script to capture the output of that and automatically populate the session token variable here, but I just wanted to show you how that's working behind the scenes. So we've defined that session token variable and let's let's do some stuff now, right? So let's get all the virtual machines that are currently listed in the Altero VM backup console. So we use that commandlet that's out there and we pass the second to the session token as a variable. So let's go ahead and run that. And we get, again, some JSON output, but we can see here, you know, we've got this virtual machine that's in the Altero VM backup console. You know, here's the, you know, the compressed size. We can see some sizing metrics. When is the last backup time? Um, you know, so with that, what if we need to get last backup details? So I'm thinking like a situation where maybe I'm creating a dashboard. Um, you know, we can we can use this API for creating dashboards. Um, we have this uh, this thing in Altero VM Backup called the uh, the Virtual Machine Reference ID, which is a unique identifier that our product assigns to each virtual machine. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm just populating that that uh, Virtual Machine Reference ID, and then we have to call that in addition to the session token with um, the next command. So let's get the backup details right. And so here we can see, okay, here here's the how long the last backup ran, when it ran. Um, were there any errors? No, so it's null. What's the backup location? We can use the API to grab all these different pieces of information, right? Now, for the uh, the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and um, cut that demo short there. Um, so we end all of the sessions. So I, I tell the API, hey, we're done. Close all the sessions. Um, you can drill into any of those commandlets. So I've got one of them open here. Um, you can see that uh, the help stuff is in here. Um, the how to get to the local API is in here. Um, and I wanted to really showcase this, the invoke rest method. This is the, the magic in each of these commandlets. This is the PowerShell commandlet that actually calls that rest API and allows you to do stuff with it. So, uh, you know, that's a real short crash course on our rest API. We've got all kinds of documentation out of altero.com slash API, and you can uh, dig into that. And um, I'll also put this PowerShell script on a, a community GitHub repo that we will send out after the session today. So with that, I think we've got one more demo to do in just a, a couple minutes here, Zav, right? So I'm going to pass things over to you really quick. Um, to do demo five. I think you just have a, a, a quick UI to show us, right? 
Yeah, I'm just I'm just going to show you the UI, what it looks like, uh, what you can do with it. Um, so this UI is uh, like a, a small PowerShell forms based tool um, that runs scripts uh, par with parameters and inputs and allows you to deploy VMs. Um, so I have a simpler version and a more complicated version. So you'll see that there's um, there's actually uh, a blog that's about to, to be released in which we uh, explain all of that. Uh, so you'll find all the information on it and I'm just going to show you what it looks like. So as you can see, you can create that all in PowerShell. So it's based on PowerShell forms. Um, in this case, I have a vCenter uh, input box. So I'm going to specify my vCenter name, corvc.lab.priv, uh, connect. And then it's going to unlock all the fields. And once all the fields are unlocked, you can deploy whatever VM you want. Uh, select a cluster, for example. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, select the data store if you have several one of them. Uh, a poll group. So all these things that you need when you deploy a VM, you have them there. Uh, you can do it quickly, uh, like much quicker than if you had to go through custom specs and uh, all these things in the vCenter UI. Uh, you can change your base disk, vCPUs, and uh, then it will customize it for you and uh, you don't have anything to do. So it's it doesn't replace uh, tools like uh, Terraform, uh, Chef, Puppet, all these things, because they are purpose-based. Purpose um, but it's quite handy as well, just to uh, just uh, to get your get your team started to deploy VMs. Uh, so here I need my uh, domain password. Uh, and uh, hit deploy and then you can just watch the progress bar deploy your vms so as you can see the, the vm is being deployed uh, once it's finished uh, it will actually i think i chose the wrong custom spec but it doesn't matter it's just for the for the example oh. so yeah as you can see specified parameter wasn't correct because i used uh, um, a Windows custom spec on a Linux template, but you know it's it shows that you have to you have to uh, to really pick the pick the right parameters. So um, GUI tools they're not meant to replace uh, deployment tools, uh, and it doesn't have to be VM deploy. Uh, it could be anything, just as long as it it serves a purpose. Uh, don't create a UI just because it's nice and shiny. Uh, because it takes time, it's it's quite a bit of work. Uh, it needs to fix a to fix a problem. So, for example, if, if your team spends a day uh, deploying VMs, uh, maybe with a with a GUI like that, it's free. It's it's might help your team save some time. Um, use cases are limited to your imagination. You could do anything with UIs. Uh, you could use it at scale by feeding it with a CSV file batch for batch processing and stuff like that. Uh, so you could do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, yeah, so one big thing about UIs is make it dummy proof. Uh, get lots of error handling in it. Uh, you don't want people to start deploying VMs with uh, 16 terabytes of storage because you're going to have a pretty interesting uh, phone call to that. Um, so yeah, start playing with, uh, with, with GUI. We've got a... We've got a blog coming out in a, in a few weeks, days, I don't know when, but uh, it explains everything and you could start from there. Sounds good. I think uh, we've actually got some of the code for this out in the community repo as well, Xavier, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, we do that. So I'll be sending a link to everyone, all the attendees to get to that uh, particular GitHub repo. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab uh, presenter yeah. back really quick. And we've got just, uh, I wanna be cognizant of everyone's time. So I'm gonna really kind of scoot through the remaining um, the remaining content. The one big thing I wanted to leave you with was this additional resources slide. So we linked to some of this stuff already earlier in the session. So how to get started with Power CLI, those top two links, a link to the landing page of the uh, the ebook that we talked about. Again, you can get that ebook through the handout section of the GoToWebinar UI as well. 
And um, I mentioned the blog post on how to encrypt passwords inside of PowerShell. So I've got the link to that there as well, as long as some links to our various uh, blog platforms. So you will be getting a copy of the slide deck. So don't feel, you, feel like you have to jot these down really quick. Um, in terms of um, the questions, I think we've answered a good chunk of the questions here. Um, if we haven't, again, I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Um, we're already at the uh, already at the uh, the hour mark here, but I just want to let everybody know that um, if you asked a question that did not get an answer, we will certainly follow up with you, and um, we'll do like a follow up blog post that has a full list of the Q and A, um, as well as all the various resources that we talked about as part of our webinar today. So with that, like I said, I kind of want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Um, Xavier, I want to thank you for coming and sharing your your knowledge. All kinds of great tools for people to test out. So, so really appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me and uh, have a great day. Yeah, thanks everyone. We hope to see you for another Altero webinar here in the future. Other than that, we'll let you get back to your day. And again, be on the lookout for some of those resources uh, coming here sometime uh, after the webinar in the next couple of days. Thanks and have a great one.